The following podcast is going to contain spoilers along with me, just a regular guy, talking about all the things I love, such as comics, movies, television, music, and books. So yeah, proceed at your own risk. Welcome to the first episode of Just Another Fanboy. I'm your host, Steven, and it's been a long time, hasn't it? 2000, good Lord, 2008, I think, was the last time I put out an episode of Just Another Fanboy. For those who may not have heard the trailer, Just Another Fanboy is a podcast that stretches all the way back to August of 2006, making this month the 13th year of Just Another Fanboy. Of course, I stopped podcasting with this show back in 2008. So uh, while the name is 13 years old, I don't have 13 years worth of content, but I'm trying to make up for that now. Not, not really. I'm uh, I wanted to bring the show back and do something a month at a time, one episode per month, maybe longer episodes than what I normally used to do when it was just me talking about stuff. And Again, if you didn't listen to the trailer, I'm going to warn you right now that I don't, I'm not really taking notes. I didn't really take a lot of notes here. I've written down the two books that I'm going to be talking about today. I've written down who uh, creatively is involved in these books. And that's, (laughs) that's about it. Everything else is going to be on top of the old noggin. And that may turn out to be solid gold, 100% A number one steak sauce, solid gold podcasting, or it may not. I guess we'll find out. So this this uh, podcast is unofficially brought to you by the Public Library in Lawrence, Kansas. And I say unofficially because, well, they're not officially, officially, yeah, right away. They're not officially bringing you this podcast. This isn't their production. They're not giving me any money. No, what they're doing is providing me with a recording booth, a little studio, a small closet studio, which actually is is rather nice. It's a nice little studio. And they're not only providing it to me, it's provided to anybody with a library card. I am able to book this sucker four times a month for three hours at a time. Now, I'm not going to be in here for three solid hours today. When I do my other podcast, oh, did I mention that I have another podcast? It's called Stephen or Else, and it's more sketch-based, and I do talk a little bit about comics there. I also do some uh, news stories from around the world that I find interesting, and I, uh, I just find little bits and facts and whatnot about things in the world, be it rubber bands or Conan the Barbarian or whatever, and I share that information with you. Uh, plus again, there are, there are sketches. It's more of an entertainment show. It's edutainment and it's, it's more of a show it's produced, it's scripted, it's written. And I spend a couple hours down here deep in the basement of the Lawrence public library recording that show. Now, why is that important? It's not, not really. Nothing I'm really telling you is important. This is not an important podcast. If you were, if you were hoping to, come into this show to get some just just important stuff, if you are hoping to be part of something important, if you are hoping that 30 years down the road when scholars were discussing podcasts and they say stuff like, well, of course, we've got to talk about Just Another Fanboy because it was the most important podcast in all of human history. And, and you want to listen to that and go, I was there. I was there from the beginning. I was part of something important. Well, prepare to be disappointed because this show is not at all important. But the reason I mentioned the studio, it's probably really only interesting to me, but what they have down here in the basement, and I'm calling it the basement only because it's underground. It doesn't really look like a basement. And I, you know, I had a fairly nice basement growing up, at least, you know, in comparison to the basement I have now, which is a dirt floor and rock walls. But anyway, 
underground beneath the Lawrence Public Library. They have, ultimately, they have two studios and two suites. They call them creative suites. There's a large studio that a that a full band could come in and record music, and they do. I've been in here recording when they were when folks were over there making music. They have this studio here, which is a small studio. You can get about two people in here, two microphones, two turntables maybe, and a microphone. I don't know. I could probably fit two turntables on this little table here. Maybe if I move some stuff around, the keyboard's in the way. You know, that's that that would have to be moved. But behind me, so so the big studio is just down the hall. It's literally maybe six, seven, maybe eight steps away. Right behind me are the two creative suites. There's one in which you can do digital editing, such as, you know, photos, audio, video, stuff like that. And then there's another one right next to it where you can digitize your music and your video. It's pretty neat. They've got they've got a tape deck. They've got a VCR. I think they've got a turntable in there. And you can book that place and come in here and digitize all your stuff. And it's something I wish I would have known about when I was working at a particular, you know, uh, pharmacy chain in the photo department. And I don't know if you're going to hear that behind me. Somebody just entered the hallway of the studio. And I, and really before I started tangenting there, that was kind of the point I'm trying to make is that even though it's a recording studio, there's still some outside noise out there. Anytime anybody opens up the door to the studio, and it shouldn't happen. It should never happen. But they open up the door and you can hear it. If there's a band playing in the big studio down the hall and they're playing loudly, you can hear it. And if I'm in here recording Stephen or else, I get I tend to get a little jumpy about that because I have to stop what I'm doing every time somebody walks through that door, which which really isn't all that often. But I'm trying to make that show as perfect as possible, you know, as far as, you know, they're sketches and um, they need to have uh, certain sounds in the background, I guess you could say. This one don't care so much. If, if anybody's, you know, sometimes, sometimes people will come out of that big studio and they'll stand out in the hallway and they'll talk to each other and they'll talk in loud voices. And I have to sit here and wait for them to finish talking so that I can continue. And of course, then that also makes me think if they're standing out in the hallway and I can hear everything they're saying, then everybody out there right now can hear everything I'm saying. And that, of course, makes me a little self-conscious. Not as bad today as if I'm doing, you know, when I'm doing Stephen or else and I'm, I'm doing the funny voices That makes me a little self-conscious thinking that, you know, when there's somebody in one of those suites out there that possibly they can hear what I'm saying, but I'm going to ignore it today because I'm not really going all crazy with things today. I can't remember the tangent I was going on earlier when I stopped. It doesn't really matter. So here's, here's the deal. Just another fanboy is going to be a celebration of, of just stuff I love. Originally, it was a comic book podcast, and I will be talking about comics, and I'm going to talk about comics today, but it's also going to be about movies, uh, film. I don't really watch film. I watch movies. Music, TV, books, other podcasts, maybe, just stuff I love. Talk about my family, you know, that kind of thing. And again, it's going to be all off the top of my head. And then when I go back and edit, who knows what I'm going to keep in? Who knows what I'm going to take out? But in the end, you're going to, well, you're going to get, you're going to get this. This is what you're going to get. And if, you know, if you like this, <laughs> great, because I've got a lot of it. I've got a lot buried deep within the the cavernous regions of my body. Um, otherwise, I apologize because... Because this is what you're getting. Of course, I don't really need to apologize to you because I bet by this point you've already switched me off. And that's okay. But that just means you're going to miss out on me talking about two really good comics. One really good comic and one freaking stellar, amazing, outstanding, I'm not sure how I lived this long without reading this comic, comic. So the first book I'm going to talk about today is Middle West. This is volume one of Middle West. This was published by Image Comics on May 22nd, 2019, and it collects issues one through six of the comic book. It was written by Scotty Young with art by Jorge Corona, and the covers were done by Mike Huddleston. Now, what I'm going to do here, unlike uh, maybe what I used to do in the past with other 
other podcasts, I would uh, I I would literally go through the entire issue or book and tell you exactly what happened. And that's not what I'm going to do here with these. Probably not. I, I'm going to touch on some of my favorite moments, and I'm gonna I'm gonna pull the books up digitally as I'm talking about them because I read my stuff digitally nowadays. They're back in the day, you know, I had a, a, a like a fifty dollar a month. $75 a month comic book habit. I would drive to the comic book store every week and I would get my little stack of comics in that brown paper bag. And I miss that. I miss that so much. What I don't miss, on the other hand, is then once I'm done reading them, you know, you put them in a bag and a board, you stick them in a box, you got to store them. That's a pain in the butt. You run out of room after a while. I'm, t- I'm tired of the collecting side of reading comics. I just want to read them. And reading them digitally is, it's just the easiest way to do it because there's, you can... You can store all the books that you want on your freaking phone. We're not all of them. You know, obviously you have a certain amount of storage space. But here's what I do when it comes to uh, reading reading digitally. Uh, There's the free option. And I'm not talking about stealing. I'm not stealing these books. I go through Hoopla Digital. That's through your local library. Most, most, I I don't want to say most, but I think a lot of libraries participate in the Hoopla program. And it's where if you have a library card, you get the app on your phone or your tablet, or you can even do it on the computer and you can, you can, uh, you can download and read comics. You can download and read eBooks. Um, they got audio books. I'm pretty sure they still got music on there. They did at one point. Let me, I'll tell you what, let me just get the old phone out. And uh, this will be really, really interesting podcasting. I'm, I'm going into my Hoopla app right now. And it's taking a moment. It's telling me that my Hoopla has been brought to me by my Lawrence Public Library. That's pretty cool. And uh, let's see here. Let's go to, let's go to, yeah, music. Yeah, you got music. You can download music. You can, you can get albums and listen to them digitally for free. Now, of course, depending on your library, your library will determine how much you can get each month. Mine only allows me four, four items. I know others uh, allow you way more than that. A buddy of mine that lives in Pennsylvania, what up, Harold? He gets like seven or eight, maybe even 10. Uh, somebody I know who, who uses the library over in Topeka, Kansas, which is the capital, they get like 20. So I... I only get four. That's all right, because really, in the end, I can't read much more than that in a month, especially when you combine it with the second way I get digital comics, which is through Comixology. I am a member of Comixology Unlimited. I It costs, I think, $6 a month. The only way I can, you know, and here's the thing. I can't really, when it comes to $6 a month, that doesn't sound like much, but I, you know, I'm a low rent fanboy. I'm a, I, I'm, 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 I'm the, I don't want to say I'm the head of the family, but I'm, I'm a, I'm the father of three. I got a wife, I got a dog, I got a cat, I got a job, you know, $6 a month should really, could really go towards something else. I suppose what I'm going to, what, what, what I'm saying here, but I got this thing called the Patreon and I got some folks who contribute to the show, uh, mainly Stephen or else that's where it started through. Um, that's over at patreon.com slash Stephen R. Or, and for as little as a dollar a month, you can contribute to the show and it helps me get comics. It's, it's paying for my comiXology unlimited subscription. I also use the money to help pay the bills, uh, buy groceries, stuff like that. So that's always, you know, Hey, you're helping a family out if you join up with the old Patreon. Now this podcast is being released to everybody. Everybody's getting this. But the folks over at the Patreon who pay $2 or more a month, they get this two weeks early. You know, not that. I mean, I guess that can be a big deal. They're getting it two weeks early. Uh, sure. What? But, you know, wow, I'm, I'm really having a, a horrible time trying to sell my Patreon. I'm not really good with, with that at all. And I feel, I actually don't feel bad. I don't feel bad at all. It's just, that's just the way I am. And uh, I don't feel bad. Should I, should I feel bad? Should I feel terrible about that? Should I, uh, should I feel bad that I can't sell myself? Probably, probably a little bit. I should probably feel a little bad about that. I don't know. But if you only want to contribute a dollar a month over at the Patreon, so our, I've got three levels over there. There's the dollar, there's the $2 and there's the $5. And 
for as little as a dollar a month, you're going to get my other podcast, which is called My Other Podcast. Isn't that clever? It's called My Other Podcast. And I do that at least at least once a week. For probably the past six months, it's been twice a week. I mean, we're coming up on uh, almost 90 episodes at this point. By the time this goes out, it's probably going to be close to 90 episodes. And uh, those go exclusively to my patrons. Every once in a while, before I rebooted Stephen or else, man, that's a whole backstory I'm not willing to get into here because we were supposed to be talking about a completely different comic. And that's, you know, that's if you listen to the trailer, that's what I do here. I tangent and I, and I, I have tangented quite a bit. So let's just get back to uh, Middle West Volume 1. And uh, the reason now, now I, I now remember why I got off. I got on my, my, my tangent is because I was explaining how, you know, why I read books digitally. And, uh, so this one I got through Hoopla. I actually got both of them through Hoopla. Um, this is one I've been looking forward to for a great long time. I've been hearing really good things about it. And let me just read you. Well, if I can get the mouse to work on this computer, cause suddenly my, the mouse has stopped working. That's, that's not good at all. Let me just turn it off for a second here. Sometimes if you turn the, you know, a wireless mouse off and then you turn it back on and, uh, yeah, it's not doing anything. Now it's going to, there we go. All right. So I said, I wasn't going to go through every page and and tell you everything that's going to happen in the book. I wasn't going to do that. So instead what I'm going to do is I'm going to read you the official blurb, the official description, the official marketing description that pulls people in and wants them to read the book. And then I'm just going to talk about the book and uh, some of my favorite moments. So let's let's go with the blurb first. The lands between the coasts are vast, slow to change, and full of hidden magics. The town of Farmington has been destroyed, sending an unwitting adventurer and his vulpine companion in search of answers and to quell a coming storm that speaks his name. From author Scotty Young, who did stuff like I Hate Fairyland, Deadpool, Fortunately, The Milk. And I don't know if Fortunately is, is, you know, they they didn't do a really good job here because they didn't put the word and in when they put this list. So we've got I Hate Fairyland, comma, Deadpool, comma, Fortunately, Fortunately, comma, The Milk. So I'm assuming it's not Fortunately, The Milk. It's Fortunately and then the title, The Milk. Also with here, you've got uh, artist Jorge Corona, who did number one with the bullet, Feathers, and Big Trouble in Little China, Old Man Jack. So with these two guys, you got uh, the tale of Abel, a young boy who must navigate an old land in order to reconcile his family's history. The perfect read for fans of dark fantasy like Return to Oz, classic Don Bluth animation, and or Miyazaki animation. Now, I know that Scotty Young, I know personally, I don't know personally, I just know from listening to podcasts, that he's a big fan of the uh, Oz books. So it makes sense that he would write something that uh, people would compare to Oz. So yeah, this is a book about a kid named Abel, and he lives in Farmington in the Middle West. And I can't really, you know, the Middle West is not our world, not at all. There's magic, there's magic in the Middle West, there's magic in this world. Um, it's, it's kind of a, it's kind of an herb, it's kind of a fantasy world and yet not, it's a modern world with fantasy elements, which I suppose you could say is urban fantasy, but it's not our world. It's got technology, but it's also got monsters and, and, and junk like that. So Abel, he's a, uh, he's a paper boy and he lives with his dad. His mom has left. She abandoned them for whatever reason, and Abel is a paper boy, and his dad is full of anger towards Mr. Abel, and they fight all the time. And it comes to a head when Abel is out delivering papers, and he decides to uh, go hang out with his friends and then shoplift some stuff from a convenience store, which gets him arrested. He and his dad get in a huge fight. And his dad turns into this freaking tornado monster and nearly kills Abel and he destroys their house and Abel runs away and his vulpine companion is a fox, a fox that talks. And so they go on the run. And so this book is all about you find out 
once they go on the run, that, that whatever happened, whatever his father has done uh, and is able to turn into this tornado monster, it seems to have affected Abel as well. He suddenly has this mark on his chest, and when he gets angry, he uh, because at one point as he's running away, his dad in his tornado form reaches out his tornado hand and puts a tornado finger right through Abel's chest, and that's what puts the mark on his chest. And so when he gets angry, he too starts turning into a tornado monster. And uh, so he's traveling through the Middle West. He comes across an old man who's kind of a wizard, and the wizard tells him that there there's a woman that travels with a uh, like a traveling carnival, and she she should be able to help him. And so Abel and the fox take off in the middle of the night, uh, leaving. I think I don't remember. I know they take off, and uh, they track down the carnival, and so they're they're living. With this carnival, the carnival is in this particular town at the time, and they're living um, not with the carnival, but living in hiding. They're there for a couple of days. They're trying to find this woman, this magician, Magdalena. And in order to eat, they take to stealing. And at one point, they steal a wallet from a guy, and some of the carnies see this happen. It's a, it's a, it's a little, it's a not a little girl. She's about Abel's age, which is probably about maybe 14, 15, 16, somewhere around there. She sees him. She gets all of her carny friends, and they they, they, they come after him. Well, the lady who runs the carnival, uh, she intervenes. You find out that she is um, this the, the old man, the wizard. She's his brother, and she knows magic. And as they're, they're about to uh, capture, I guess it is, Abel for stealing, he starts freaking out and he starts to turn into the tornado monster and she comes in and uses her magic. She says some spells and calms him down. And so then he he asks her, you know, he tells her that he was looking for her because he needs her help. She tells him that she might be able to help him. She can probably help him. But the fact of the matter is he's stolen. Not only has he stolen food from the carnival, he's also stolen from one of the people that have that have come to the carnival. And she can't they can't have that. They can't the, their carnival can't have a reputation of allowing pickpockets to go free. And so he proposes that he stay with the carnival, work for them, work off their debt. She agrees because she's going to need time to try to figure out how to help him. So he goes to work for the carnival and he ends up really enjoying it. And he finds a place among them. He finds he, he finally finds what he feels is a place in life and he feels comfortable there and he feels he's accepted and he's part of a family. Well, in the meantime, his father sets out to try to find him. And there I, I'm assuming they don't really mention it, but he seems to be able to he, he he seems to be able to track them down. Um or at least he's close enough behind them that he he finds he finds the old wizard, for example, and goes all tornado y and wrecks where you know that guy's house and all that stuff and so the wizard sends his pet crow off to warn his sister that tornado monster dude's coming and so she packs up the uh the carnival and they set off and they say look there's a we got to go there's a storm coming we don't want anybody to be hurt and we're actually going to skip the next couple towns to try to stay ahead of the storm but she knows that's because his uh, Abel's dad the giant tornado monster man is coming and she at one point she brings Abel into her her little her little uh her little mobile office and she tells him that it's she you know a he's paid off his debt and he's free to go whenever he wants he says he wants to stay she's happy to let him stay uh everybody there likes him he works hard and they've accepted him and uh she says she's also ready to start she thinks she's ready to start helping him and so the first thing she does is she uses her magic so that the two of them can step into his own mind and see his memories, which uh, seems to only take about 10 minutes before he really starts freaking out and he starts to turn into a tornado monster. And when she comes out, she finds out she's been, they've, they've been at it for 12 hours and he's turning into this tornado monster and it's too late to stop him. And that's, that's kind of where the book ends. This, uh, this was a really good book. Like I said, I've been hearing really good things about it. A lot of the a lot of the podcasts I listen to and the people that I follow on Twitter, um, 
when it, as it was coming out, I'm, I, I believe it's still the, the single issues are still coming out. But when the first when these six issues were coming out, people were really talking it up. I'm assuming the, ish, the books are still coming out because this did end on a cliffhanger. Um, so I will be looking for volume two. But I found the story. I found the world very interesting. At one point, they they have to cross a bridge, uh, a covered bridge, and a troll is living inside the bridge. The troll gives him a a, a riddle and says, if he can solve the riddle, they can they can pass and go you know go away. If they if he can't solve the riddle or if he can't solve it within a certain amount of time, then of course she's going to eat him. Pretty sure the troll was a woman. He does solve the riddle, but he doesn't solve it in time, and so they have to uh, they have to get away from a troll. So that was fun. They're on a train at one point, and there's like these mutant, like a I think one guy was like a bird guy, and they they try to uh, they try to roll him, try to get him some money off of him, and uh, so there's this whole fantasy element that I really like with these monsters and mutant, uh, you know animal people and there's a talking fox and yet at the same time there's almost kind of a steampunk type of technology going along going uh, along around them there's a lot of the towns that they go into and they show there there are a lot of these like tanks on top of buildings i'm assuming they're different towns there's one on top of the train that they're on and there's one on top of one of the buildings in um the uh, at the carnival, but you you see a lot of these tanks, these these clear. They look almost like vacuum tube type tanks that are filled with a, a pink substance. And I don't know what that's all about, but for some reason, I find it really interesting. You really get the sense that this is a very old world. This isn't a new world. This isn't something that uh, this isn't a world that people are just you know the they're just coming to their to their own and trying to. Uh, you know, use the technology to eke out a living. This is, this looks like a world that's been around for a great long time. And this is, and it, and and it even to a certain extent, maybe at some point it was a world like ours that has moved on to this, this crazy amalgamation of science and magic. Cause like the old man, when we, you know, he's a wizard and he's carrying this staff and it's got a light on top of it, but it's like a big light. It's like a big narrow light bulb type thing. So it's it's electronic. And we get to his house, which is made up of it's just like this patchwork thing. There's a school bus that's part of it. There's more of these tanks full of this pink water. It's just it's a very interesting world. It's a it's a very interesting world, and it's very visually interesting. And visually, the comic book is stunning. Jorge Corona is an amazing artist and it really, there's a part of me, it kind of bothers me when I look at um, a lot of the stuff that's coming out from Marvel and DC, when I look at their big titles, their popular titles, and I look at the art on these books, they just don't hold a candle to stuff like this. In my opinion, I really like this kind of stylized, almost animated uh, type of art such as what we got here with with uh, Jorge Corona and then what we got with uh with uh the next book I'm going to talk about it's the same type of thing it's just this very kinetic almost it almost looks alive and whereas a lot of the 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 superhero books I look at nowadays the new ones when I look at previous it's just the art does not look it looks dead it looks like art it can be technically it can look, technically it could look beautiful they can be fully painted. And, uh, I don't know. They're just, this kind of stuff here is just, it's just beautiful. And I would, I don't want to say I lean towards superheroes, but that was my bread and butter. That's what I grew up on. And I always end up whenever, cause I go through these cycles where I'll read comics and then I'll stop and then I'll read comics again. And then I'll stop for a while. And then I'll get back into comics. And every time, every Every time the wheel turns and I'm back to reading comics, I always immediately drift toward the superhero books and eventually move towards stuff like Middle West because, well, I think because, A, the stories are better um, and the art is always, it's just better. It's just better art. I think um, people who tell these types of stories um, and in in essence, they're 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 independently made. It's Image Comics, so uh, 
this is the story that these folks wanted to tell with these characters. They created it from the ground up and they have more, they have more, uh, they have more skin in the game. And I think there's something to say about books like that. I think there's there, you, you can, you can definitely, when you read a book like this, you can almost feel the love that this, that these creators have for the story in the book itself, because they've done such a good job doing it. Right. There's no, there's some, there's certain panels here that are pulled back and the characters, their faces, um, he draws them so that there are no, there are no facial features on. It's just a blank. It's like the question. And even that to me, doesn't feel like the, the artist is half assing it because I'm looking at a panel right now where Abel is standing there and his face is just completely blank. There's no eyes, there's no nose, there's no mouth. And, but everything else in the book, it's, it's not like he, the, the artist was like, okay, this is a small panel, so I can't spend a lot of time on it. It's more like he, it was an artistic choice because there's so much else going on in this panel. There's these shelves full of these different doodads and, and, and whatnot, and there's plants and there, the fox is there, and there's just so much going on in this panel. And then the panel next to it, where there is absolutely no background whatsoever, and that's when he really takes a lot of time to... Uh, give Abel, you know, the eyes and the nose and the mouth and the freckles. And there's, there's a definite, you know, expression there of fear and anger. And it's just, man, it's just, it's such a, it's, it's, I have to, I don't know. I would love to see this kind of stuff. I don't want to say that art like this is ruined on books like these, because if anything, I love books like these more than stuff like Spider-Man and Green Arrow and Superman and whatnot. But if, if for example, the team from Middle West went to do a Green Arrow book, I'd be all over that. That would be freaking amazing. But stuff like that's never going to happen because creators like this have these stories that they want to tell and they want to get out there and tell them. And I get it because I have some stuff. I have some stories I want to tell. I wish I had, you know, folks that I knew that would help me tell these stories. I know I know Harold. Harold's right now, he's telling his own story. He's working on his own book that's going to be freaking amazing when it's done. And... uh you know, I envy that. I envy that about you, Harold. All right, so the second book I'm talking about this month is Murder Falcon, Volume 1. This also was published by Image Comics. And the collection came out on July 10th, 2019, and it collects issues 1 through 8 of the comic book. And based on how this ended and uh, based on what I've seen since, I think this is it. This is a story that this guy wanted to tell, and the story's over. It was written... With uh, It was written by Daniel Warren Johnson. He also did the art, and Mike Spicer did the colors. And so let me read you the blurb real quick, and then we'll, we'll talk about the book. The world is under attack by hideous monsters, and Jake's life is falling apart until he meets Murder Falcon. He was sent from the heavy to destroy all evil, but he can't do it without Jake shredding up a storm. Now, with every chord Jake plays on his guitar, the power of metal fuels Murder Falcon into all-out kung fu fury on those that seek to conquer Earth. From Daniel Warren Johnson, creator of the Eisner-nominated Extremity, comes Murder Falcon. Get ready to shred. Now, on the surface, when I first heard about this book, when I would see stuff about it in, you know, online... On the surface, the blurb is barely touches what this book is really about. I mean, on the surface, yeah, it's a guy who who with with long blonde hair, his name is Jake, and he plays guitar and he shreds and he plays metal. And through his music, this spirit creature named the Murder Falcon, which is like part man, part falcon with a big cybernetic robot right arm. And together they fight monsters. And the power of metal helps fight monsters. And so just on that premise alone, I was in. I was ready to go. I, w I wanted to be a part of this book. However, as I have said, I am a low-rent fanboy. And so I had to wait until the book was done, till they collected it, and it was on Hoopla. So once it was on Hoopla, I got it for August and started to read it. And within the first few pages, I'm hooked. It's like I'm seeing something 
that I've never seen before. And yet I'm seeing something that is so familiar, that is so a part of me, that I don't understand why it's taken me this long to see a book like this. So let me just talk you through these first couple pages. So right away, literally, the first panel we have is a giant monster walking through the city, destroying things. People are running from it. There's a there's a cop on the scene, and a tank comes along. They try to fire upon the monster. The monster looks like some weird, demonic, naked mole rat. If you've ever seen a naked mole rat, you know that those things are just all kinds of creepy. And this is this is a giant demonic version of a of a naked mole rat. And so the the tank tries to fire on the monster, the monster destroys the tank, and suddenly a van pulls up. And this is like this is like an old van from the 80s. It's very it's it's the same model van that was the A-team van, but this one's blue. It's got the spoiler on the back, it's blue, it's got orange stripes on it. And it comes squealing up to the scene and a guy gets out and he's wearing jeans and an orange T-shirt. He's got blonde hair flowing in the wind and he's got a guitar and a gig bag on his back. And the cop sees him step out of his car and he's, you know, who are you? And the guy says, I'm Jake. And then a woman starts screaming, it's going to eat my baby. It's going to eat my baby. And the... (laughs) Jake yells out to the monster, hey, ugly, yeah, I'm talking to you. There'll be no baby eating on my watch. And the cop's like, you know, like, well, what are you going to do? And the guy, Jake pulls out his guitar and he says, I brought metal. So right away, I'm like, this is so my freaking book. And he starts shredding and Murder Falcon comes out. And Murder Falcon, like I said, he's got the body of a man, the head of a falcon. He uh, has this giant, like, overly large robotic right arm. He's got a headband on, a flowing headband. He wears, like, a khaki pant, like like a, like khaki cargo-type pants, big old baggy, like, uh, military-style pants with chucks on. This is This book is right up my street. And so I'm reading along, and I'm just amazed at how beautiful this book is, how great the story is, how awesome it is, because it just rocks, and it's just talking about metal, and how metal is the only thing that can destroy the monsters, and I am just so into it. And there's a there, there's a point there within the first couple issues that I'm just thinking to myself, this book is the most amazing thing I have ever read. And then suddenly the book gets better. And I'm like, hold on a minute. This book is getting better. So here's what here's what you find out. The, 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 the real premise, the real idea behind the book is there is a world outside of our own where these monsters dwell. And the guy who leads the monsters, he feeds off of our fear and our misery and our worry. Human beings spend a lot of time being afraid. They spend a lot of time being worried. They spend a lot of time just worrying over life, just all the little things in your life, paying bills, whether or not you're going to get into the right school, whether how, you know, even is your job, is is this the job that you, do you really want to do this job every day? Is there a better job out there? Do I want to, do I want to leave this job for, for another job? What if I get another job and it's better pay, but I hate it more than the job I'm at now? You know, that kind of stuff. There's, we're always full of fear and worry and misery. And this guy feeds off of it. And the more he feeds, the stronger he gets. And he's sending monsters into our world. And his ultimate goal is to open this tear so that he can come through and take us all over and feed, feed on us, just suck us dry. Well, come to find out that the only thing, bullets don't hurt it. None of this stuff hurts it, truly. What hurts it is music. And because music is the one thing that pretty much all of us have in our lives, whenever we're, whenever we're feeling, whenever we're worried, even if it's something as small as, uh, I had a bad day at work and worry that we have all the time over little things. Am I raising my kids right? If, am, you know, am, did, am I eating right? Did I, did I choose, did I choose the right freaking 
burger to eat today? Should I have chosen something else? And the one thing that a lot of us have in our lives that will take that worry, that will take that fear, that will take that misery out of our life, even for the length of an album, is music. And so through music, certain people, when they play their instruments, can summon these spirit creatures like Murder Falcon to battle these evil monsters. And now, so for most of the book, it's all mainly focused, not just on, not just specific, not just music in general, but specifically metal. And I remember reading at one point why he chose metal. Not only was he he a big metal fan, but, you know, there's just something about metal that is silly um, and just the right kind of metal just makes you, just makes you happy, right? Just drives all that stuff out of you. And so that's, that's what Jake is. And well, then you, but you find out as you go a little further along that Jake's had a really hard time in, in, in his life. All this crap has been happening to him. And, and uh, I'm not going to spoil any of it because I, this, I'm going to say it right now. And I said it on Twitter. This is the single greatest comic book of the decade. Now, I don't read a lot of new comics, so I don't have a lot to compare it to. But I feel like the books that I've read that are newer over the last decade, I feel like I've been picking really good books because I've been reading stuff like Grumble. I've been reading stuff like um, Paper Girls. I've been reading stuff like, uh, well, like Middle West. And I'm loving all that stuff. But this one just outshines them all. And, you know, like I said, I came to at one point in the first couple books where the first couple issues where I'm just thinking this is the most amazing book. And then it gets better. That happens two other times in the book I get to I get a few more issues in and I'm just I'm just over the moon over how great this book is this is the single greatest book that I have ever read and then it gets better three times at least it did that to me where I just I couldn't believe how amazing this book was and how much I was loving it and then it just gets better I mean how many books have you read that you can say that about that you can that you can say that right away you were hooked. Within three pages, you realize that this was the book for you. By the end of the first issue, you realize that this is one of the greatest books you have ever read. And by the second issue, everything that you, every, when you thought it wasn't going to get any better, it got better. And then that happens two other times in the book. That was Murder Falcon. On the surface, and I, I, I've been trying to stress this to people. On the surface, it seems like a pretty silly book, and it is. There's a, there's some. It's it is silly, but it's a wonderful silly. But then there is so much more. There's it gets so deep at times in this book, and it really. I read on uh, uh, when when I I posted on Reddit that I was reading the book, and somebody one of the replies somebody said that uh, by the end of it they were crying, and I was there. That this was this was such an amazing book. I cannot sing its praises more. Now, like I said, I'm not going to spoil a lot, but I I am going to talk about a couple of things. So we find out in the book that Jake used to be a member of a band called Bruticus. And uh, we meet their bass player right at the beginning of the book. And we find out that they are no longer a band that something tragic happened in Jake's life. I'm not going to spoil to you what it is. And due to that tragedy, he shuts himself off from everyone in his life. He, he has such a fit of anger at a practice. Now, this is a practice that they had. They were supposed to uh, play a show in which a rep from a label was going to be there. They had reached a point where they were hugely popular, they were about to be signed. They apparently had um, released some of their own stuff because we find out that they are actually very popular in Japan. But they had a label rep coming to this show. They were probably going to be signed, and he doesn't show up. He doesn't come. He comes to practice the next day to find out that they have this other guitar player, and they've been practicing with this other guy just in case Jake flaked out on him, and he throws a huge fit. And he smashes his guitar against the against an amp, and he breaks his guitar. And then at that point, he just he just stops playing. And so by the time he meets, you know, Murder Falcon, it's just he's at a very low point in his life. And 
he has to conquer this fear and this misery that he has put himself into because of this tragedy in order to, to save the freaking world, you know, to save the known world as we know it. And it is just so good. It's such a good book. It's got such a good message. And of course, there is metal all over it. There's a point there in the first issue where after they battle their first monster, he and Murder Falcon are sitting on top of his van and they're drinking beer and they are uh, listening to uh, the radio. There's a stereo and they're rocking out. There's the, this band is just shredding and there's lyrics in the background. They, they, they do a really good job of the, the onomatopoeia of the, of the instruments but they they put the lyrics to this song in the background of the of the of the panels and i didn't recognize the words now i grew up listening to metal but i also grew up in kansas i had a buddy that i grew up with named paul who collected all the magazines he was i was really into metal but i was one of these guys that once i discovered certain bands that's that's kind of what i stuck with and every once in a while you know He'd come to school and he'd be like, hey, listen to this new band. He was he was always the one that would bring me the new bands. And um, at one point, my music tastes started to differ from him. I started to getting into more rap and then the heavier stuff like uh, Anthrax and M.O.D. and S.O.D. and stuff like that and Megadeth. And and he he stayed more with the. Uh, you know, the, 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 the poison and the Motley crew. And, but he, he started to branch off into more what I would consider obscure metal bands. They weren't, I think if you asked most people who grew up really listening to metal, they would tell you that some of these bands weren't, weren't obscure, but this band, this, these lyrics were from an actual song and the song ends and another song comes on. And so I start, I look up these lyrics cause I didn't recognize them. And they were from a band called Racer X uh, that had a guitar player named Paul Gilbert. Now, I had heard of both Racer X and Paul Gilbert. I had an album by a band called Mr. Big that Paul Gilbert was in with Billy Sheehan. Um, was that his name, Billy Sheehan? Now i got to look that up. Let's see. Mr. Big Band. Well, let's see. Yeah, Billy Sheehan. Paul Gilbert, Eric Martin, Billy Sheehan, uh, Pat Torpy, and Richie Coatson. Anyway... So I remember who Paul Gilbert was, but apparently one of his first bands was this band Racer X. And I remember that Paul was really into him, but for some reason, I don't remember ever really getting into him. I don't even know that I really gave him a chance. I think uh, I, I, that's that's kind of the way my memory was, is that Paul was really into Racer X and I just never really gave him a chance. Um, but because of this book, I, I went out and I started looking up uh, stuff about Racer X, looking up looking mu I, I especially wanted to listen to these two songs that they featured in the book. They were both awesome. They both rocked. Um I am now in the market to buy uh eventually some Racer X albums when I have some money that I can that I can, you know, purchase I'll probably check them out through Spotify or something, I guess. I don't know. But that happened because of this book. And uh then I discover that there is an actual that that uh this guy um Daniel Warren Johnson he and a buddy of his recorded a whole album under the band Bruticus it's out there on on um Bandcamp I haven't listened to the whole thing yet I've listened to a couple songs they freaking rock he shreds I there doesn't appear to be any lyrics it appears to be all instrumental so it would, it it honestly I think would be a good thing to listen to while you're reading this book. So if you haven't read the book yet, maybe go get this album out on Bandcamp and listen to it while you're reading the book. That would probably be cool. I wish I would have done that. But I just I'm not sure what else to say cuz I just love this book so much. Here, let me let me tell you how much I love this book. So I waited for the collection to be put together. I waited till it was free on Hoopla. I read it on Hoopla. I loved it. So much that I turned around and went to Comixology Unlimited and bought all eight issues. I'd already read it. Why do I need to buy the eight issues? Because I know I'm going to read it again. And honestly, I just finished the book, bought the eight issues, opened up the first one, and I, and I started reading it again. And it was just as enjoyable, literally reading it three days after I had finished already reading the first issue. 
So this is the book that I'm going to be talking about a lot because I think everyone should read it because it was that good. Now, do you have to enjoy metal to enjoy the book? Probably not. I mean, if I think it, I think it, uh, I think it enhances your enjoyment of the book if you were into metal, but I don't think you have to be a fan of metal music to enjoy the book. There is a point in the book where um, they end up in Japan and there's a symphony like the, this, this, uh, you know, classical music, this symphony, this uh, strings and brass and percussion, they help in this battle and they have all these spirit creatures and it's, oh man, it's so good. That was one of the, that was one of the moments in the book that I was just like, this has suddenly got so much better. There's another band that we meet at one point in the book that are from uh, Norway or somewhere like that. And they are, they have a black and white face paint on like Kiss, but they're not all in costume like Kiss. But the, the, his art in this book, there, there are, there are scenes where he's drawing these bands playing their instruments. And I can see that in music videos or the many, the many shows that I have seen live, the many bands that I have gone, not many as an M I N I, but M A N Y. Okay. Let me get that straight. The multitude of bands I have seen live. That's how these guys stand. That's how these guys play. That's it's just, it's just so good. It is just it was just such a good book. And I could probably sit here and talk about it for another hour, but I'm not gonna. And I think I've talked about all the stuff I really wanted to make sure that I got across about this book. But as this show is supposed to be a celebration of the things I love, this book is something that I am very dearly in love with at this point in time. And I probably will be for, for a long time. This is going to be those one of those books like Proof that I'm going to be talking about for a great long time. And one of the first things I did after I finished reading it and I bought all the issues and I listened to Bruticus on Bandcamp, I went to Twitter. I found that Daniel Warren Johnson was on Twitter. I started following him. I tweeted at him and thanked him for this book. And I think more people, I do think more people need to do that. Um, people who create stuff, yes, they, 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 they like the money. They need the money. They're, they're, they're trying to make a living creating this stuff, but they're also creating this stuff from themselves. They are, they're pulling these stories. They're pulling this, 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 uh, this passion for these, these stories out of themselves and they're putting it out there. They're just there. It's, it's like they're, they're just unlocking a piece of their, their selves and they're just putting it out there on display for everybody to see. And if you can just tell someone, I saw what you created. I listened to your music. I read your book, I saw your painting, I whatever, and I really enjoyed it and I want to thank you for creating that because it meant a lot to me. Man, that means a lot to creators. I think it does anyway. So, that's the episode. That's the first episode of Just Another Fanboy. I hope you enjoyed it. I I've, I've enjoyed just sitting down here talking about two books that I really had a good time reading. I really liked Middle West. I know I talked more about Murder Falcon, but that's just because I did like Murder Falcon more. But I did really like Mur uh, Middle West, and I'm looking forward. I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna read more of that as it comes out. I think one of the reasons why I'm really bearing down on Murder Falcon more than Middle West is because there's no more of Murder Falcon. That's it. Those eight issues. That's it. And I, and you know, so far I did like it a lot more than Middle West, and. You know, it tells you that Daniel Warren Johnson is the creator of a book called Extremity. So I went out to look for that, and uh, that looks really good. So that's going to be the next thing I get out of Hoopla. And if I end up liking it just as much as I liked Murder Falcon, then I'll probably buy those freaking issues again or as well. But it's it's like two volumes worth of uh, collection. So it's a, there's a volume one and a volume two out there on Hoopla. I've already used my four borrows for August. So that's got to wait till September. So uh, who knows if I'm going to talk about that on an upcoming episode or not. But here's what I do have planned. If you haven't listened to the trailer, I know I want to do in October, I'm going to do an episode about Monty Python. October is Monty Python's 50th anniversary, 50 years in October of 2019. The first episode aired in October of 1969 on October the 5th. 
October 5th, 1969. So for Stephen or else, all four episodes you're going to get in October are going to be Monty Python themed. If you're listening to Stephen or else, you know that I do like the Franks and Bean sketches. I'm already planning on doing sketches that will be homages, homages, homages to other Monty Python sketches. I'm going to do the, the the information bits will probably be stuff about Monty Python. You know, those are going to be very Monty Python themed. But for, for the Just Another Fanboy episode in October, so it's going to be your third episode, it's going to be all about Monty Python. And uh, looking forward to that. I want to do an episode on the Aquabats. That is a band that I have uh, recently discovered over the last couple of years. They've been around since the 90s. They've had a, a TV show called the Aquabat Super Show that I love. Um, they're coming back in a big way thanks to a big Kickstarter campaign. They're going to have more albums out and some more shows and uh, looking forward to all that new stuff. So I want to do an episode on the Aquabats. I know I want to do an episode on Madman, uh, which was probably one of the first books that I truly fell in love with, and that was back in the 90s. It was a Mike Allred book. And I know I want to do an episode on Superman, so that's what... Uh, Monty Python, Madman, Aquabat, Superman, September, October, November, December. So that's your 2019 for Just Another Fanboy right there. I do encourage you to leave a review, rate this show wherever you get it, tell your friends about it, all that good stuff. I'm not going to get into a whole bunch of big closing thing like I do on the other shows. I've already talked a bit about my Patreon, but if you want to, you know, if you want to send me an email, you can do that. It's uh, Stephen or else at gmail.com. You can find me on Twitter at Stephen or else, you know, if you want to tweet about the show there, go ahead. That's where I'm at. So until next month, I'm Steven and I'm just another fanboy. Take care of your teeth.